I'm excited about this being Memorial Day, and uh, the Lord drew me to the story about the memorial stones. Turn to Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 1. Lord, we thank you and praise you for your word, and we ask you, God, to anoint it. Show us truth. Show us application for our own life. In Jesus' name we ask it. If everybody stand for the reading of the word, starting in Joshua 4, starting in verse 1. And it came to pass when all the people had completely crossed over the Jordan that the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from every tribe, and command them, saying, Take for yourselves twelve stones from here, out of the midst of the Jordan River, from the place where the priest's feet stood firm, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you lodge tonight. And then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the children of Israel, one man for every tribe. And Joshua said to them, Cross over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan. And each one of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time to come, saying, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall answer them, that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed over the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. You've got to have memorials. If you don't have memorials, you lose who you are. The history is important. Nobody can know where they're going unless they know where they've been. As a people, as a nation, as a region, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes, Mark Twain said. And God talks about the reality of cycles in his word, Ecclesiastes 1.9. That which, was, which has been is what will be, and that which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. If you don't study history, a wise man said, you're doomed to repeat it. So you can't cancel history. You study history and you learn from history. And America is not where it wants to be and it's not where it's going to be, but it's a whole lot further than where it it started. I heard a, I heard a Winsome Newsom, a Winsome Sears, the lieutenant governor of the state of Virginia, a, a wonderful woman. I wish she would run for president. She's a black woman and she has been, uh, she was a, a career in the Marine Corps. She was a sergeant in the Marine Corps and she said, and she's just got this incredible perspective on life. And she said, don't tell me that America's not making progress. She said, I'm, I'm the son of, I'm, I'm a descendant of slaves that has become lieutenant governor of the state of Virginia, which was the capital of the Confederacy. Don't tell me that America's not making progress. America is making progress. America is a great place to live. America is led by the Spirit of God and created by God for His purpose. And, it, and, it, and, it's, and it's a special, there's something about a being American that is special, if you believe that, say amen. amen. We're not perfect. We're not where we want to be and not where we're going to be, but we're a whole lot further than where we started. Do we have problems? You bet we got problems. But I'm here to tell you, Jairus, enough. Jesus is the answer to every problem that this nation faces. And it's up to the church to step out and begin to lead people back to Christ. They've tried all that other stuff. It ain't worked. This progressive culture is destroying the culture it professes to fix. And if you don't have memorials and you don't have markers, you, you forget about how far you've come. You forget about what God has done in the past. Monuments remind us of where we came from. In Joshua 4, 5, and 7, he says the children will say, what do these stones mean? You tell them the story. You tell them the story of what happened. Even monuments of Confederate generals. You know, how do you, how do you, if you have, you have a thing like the Civil War in this country that was so monumental, and, 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 and I understand that some people are offended, but, but the monuments describe the history. Come on, somebody. The good and the bad. You can't cancel history. You've got to actually remember it and you have to learn from it and you have to grow from it. You know, you have to judge people too in the context of the times. This is one of the things you learn about history. You guys know I'm a history buff. I would have probably loved to have been a history teacher, i tell you the truth. I love history so much. 
But the Lord took me a different direction. But the reality is, it says in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, this is the genealogy of Noah. And Noah was perfect. He was a just man, and he was perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. But Noah had a problem with alcohol. Noah had a problem with alcohol. There's a lot of scriptural evidence that Noah could have struggled with alcoholism. But you have to judge Noah in the context of the times that he was living in. And as bad as that may sound to you today, he was perfect to God in those times. You can't extract people out of context of history. For example, there's been this big movement amongst some, some, some intelligentsia in this country to say, you know, that, that we're basically, the country was built uh, by taking advantage of slavery and, and that the original fathers owned slaves. Everybody owned slaves back then because this was a colony of England and it was legal in the, in the, in the, according to the laws of the crown of England to own slaves. Was it good? No, but it was legal and it was a customary thing. And so, and so when you came here and you started farming, I actually had a descendant who filed for a patent under King George in the 1600s uh, to come to Virginia and, and basically staked a claim to 3,400 acres. Now, did they own slaves? Probably they did. I don't know. But the difference is, it's not so. When Thomas Jefferson, when you find out that Thomas Jefferson was a former slave owner, he lived in a time when that was a prevalent practice. So here's what you need to ask. How did he treat them? Is slavery right? No, it's not right. But it was acceptable in those times. He treated them. He educated them. He took good care of them. He provided great housing for them. He made sure that they were taken care of. He was compassionate. Now you can say that's not a good enough excuse. He shouldn't have owned slaves. You can't judge a man if you don't judge him in the context of the times that he lived in. Can I get a witness out of somebody? I believe Thomas Jefferson was a good man. And I think he had a vision of a great nation. Amen. End of story. So if you don't understand history, you don't understand where you've been, you can't have any idea where you're going. And that's what monuments do in memorials as they remind us. And we think about the men that have died that we celebrate today. We celebrate their lives and their sacrifice. What did they die for <laughs> exactly? I want to revisit this concept I taught on some months ago called the American Trinity, to one to be many and to many to be one. I'm, trying, I'm, not, I'm not being sacrilegious with the Holy Trinity, which is different, but, but the principle here is, is there, are, there are three things that are so interdependent and so intertwined, yet they're different, but they don't function. The Holy Trinity is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. You need all three. You need all three. You can't leave the Holy Ghost out. You can, you can know the Word and you can be all about, you know, you can, be all, you can have the book memorized. But you have to have the Holy Spirit functioning in your life. Come on, somebody. You have to have all three. You can't just have... And so the American Trinity is the three ideas that America was basically founded on. And if you pull your quarter out of your pocket, you can find they're stamped right there on your money. Number one is, in God we trust. The opening line of the Declaration of Independence says... We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men were created equal. All men were created equal. And that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these is life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. The opening line of the Declaration of Independence, one of the great documents ever written, and it makes a definitive statement about this is that man has certain inalienable rights. They can't be taken, they can't be removed because they don't come from men, they come from the Creator. They come from God. There are things, because if you have rights that come from government, the government can rescind them. Can I get a witness out of somebody? You can't depend on government for your rights. You have certain rights that are inalienable that belong to you because you are created. And, whenever, and whenever, you, whenever you talk about a Creator, you have to talk about these these, these basic functions of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what he created us to do. And so, we trust in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We don't worship the God of the forest or the pagan gods. 
with a God that is the creator. This is what separates, do you understand this is what separates the Judeo-Christian ethic from so many of these pagan religions is that, is that there are all kinds of gods. Nobody had more gods than the Romans did. They had the pantheon. Every time they conquered a nation, they would take their god and stick it in with all the others. They would just worship them all. They were, the Romans were really religious people. I don't know if you knew that or not. The problem is they were worshiping everything from, man, they had an admiral one time. They had two chickens. They were sacred chickens, and he were in a chicken coop on his ship. He had 100 ships that had sailed uh, to sea to attack the, the navy of, of of Carthage, which was a superior navy, and, and, and the chickens were supposed to give him a sign of when to do the attack, and he got, they wouldn't eat, so he got tired of waiting on them, and he threw them overboard, and he went into the battle and lost 96 ships, ships out of the 100, came back on the four that were left. They court-martialed him and executed him for what? For throwing away the sacred chickens. <laughs> so, this sounds like some of our leaders today, I'm like... <laughs> What about the 96 ships? No, there was the sacred chickens. That's why we... You can be religious and be totally, totally, totally off the track completely. There is one creator. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he created the universe. He created us. He created this nation. And he created us to have these inalienable, you can't take them, rights. And God, we trust. We trust in him and we trust in those. Liberty. The other thing stamped on your money is liberty. A freedom to choose what our individual pursuit of happiness looks like. See, yours don't look like mine. And when you try to make a whole society look like the same, you kill that thing in the human heart that's unique. It's not about equality either of individual in outcomes. It is about equality of opportunity, but it's not about equality of individual outcomes. Liberty and equality are two different things. This idea that everybody gets a ribbon. We need to get rid of this out of our... You know who gets the ribbon? is the kid who does the best. You teach your kids the wrong thing when it's, everybody gets a participation. You can love on them. You can encourage them. You can tell them they'll do better next time. But they get the mindset that there is some guarantee of equal outcomes. That is not the American way. Everybody gets an opportunity. But the ones that work the hardest put in the most effort and have the, and have the, the heart and the, and the gifting to do whatever you're asking them to do are the ones that win. Everyone doesn't get to be the captain of the football team. It's the guy that has the most leadership and the most commitment and the most desire, the hardest work ethic. Those are the ones. And it's called a, this is called a, it's called a merit hierarchy. In other words, in other words, so everything in nature has a hierarchy. The horses got a hierarchy. Cattle got hierarchies. Everything has a hierarchy, and there are human hierarchies where you have somebody leading and somebody following, and that's the way it needs to be. <laughs> if everybody is a leader, I lead leaders. I've got like, I have a, a group of 18, 20 young ministers, and they're all leaders, and it's like herding chickens. I mean, God, they're, they're just like scattered. They go every, because they're leaders, and they're not followers naturally. And so you have to adjust your leadership style with them because they're, they're not going to do what someone else is doing because they don't care anything about that. They want to do what God's given them to do, and that's what's important to them, and that's the way it should be, see? That's the way it should be. So you have this merit hierarchy that has to be based on merit. It can't be based on your skin color. It can't be based on your privilege. It can't be based on how much money you got. It's got to be based on merit. And I had this theory about why black athletes succeed in sports so much. You want to hear it? It's because sports is the only, in their eyes, it's the only completely merit hierarchy. You know who wins the race? The guy that runs the fastest. And so you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about all these social things working on you, you know, and getting you, you if you go out there and you can catch the ball and outrun the guy, you start for the team. It's a complete merit hierarchy. The guy who's the best player is the guy who leads. And they pour their lives into that because they, they know that if they can do it, they get the prize. I think that's the way it ought to be in life. I think we ought to have the best leaders ought to be the best, ought to be leading. The ones that, though not the ones that are the most skilled political, but the ones that know how to lead, how to solve problems, they ought to be leading. Liberty is the right to your pursuit 
of happiness and what it looks like for you. That's what liberty does. It doesn't tell you it has to look like someone else's. You do your thing. You be who you are in Christ Jesus. That's liberty. And then the third one is e pluribus unum, out of one many. What makes Americans is not language and it's not ethnicity. See, you can go to Germany and you can, you can find someone that looks German and you can give them a DNA test and you can figure out if they're German or not. Because what makes you German is your ethnicity. It's your DNA. That don't make you an American. You, can't t- you, can, you can give a DNA, a, a, an American a DNA to test and you'll get all kinds of stuff. It's not ethnicity, it's not language, it's not even geography, really, that makes America one. It's out of many are extracted one people that believe in a common value. A common set of values. What are the common values? In God we trust, liberty. And out of one many, we're not all supposed to be like. Diversity is a good thing. We're not supposed to look alike. We're not supposed to think alike. We're not supposed to have the same tastes. We're not supposed to have the same life mission. We're supposed to all be doing what God created us to do, and we ought to be having people that support us in that, as long as it's of Christ. That's what e pluribus unum means. Common shared value of God-given rights, of liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So what happens when you extract God out of that equation? What happens when you take God out of that? He's the linchpin. (coughs) You know, at the meeting, the men I met with, the MS team, great young men. (coughs) These guys are real influencers in their communities and their Man, they're sold out for Christ and they're, they're raising, they got great families and they're, they're just pouring their heart into, into making a difference for Jesus. And we started talking about the shooting in Uvalde, which is Lonnie's hometown. I don't know if you knew that. And the tragedy of it. And I was proud of them because <clears throat> nearly to a man, they said, you know what, I, I feel for the families, I feel for the community, but what about the young man that pulled the trigger? What happened? Did he not have a father to love on him when he needed it? What caused him to be become a psychotic killer? When you have an all-out attack from people that are supposed to be smart, They claim to be smart on the family unit, which is a Christian idea, as being no longer important. And you have fathers that are not responsible and they're not tending to their children as they were are growing up. When you have all those conditions, you have this recipe for this psychosis which is taking over our culture. Because we've extracted God from the heart of everything in the name of a secular society. We've taken him out of the schools. We've taken him out of government. We've taken him out of everything we can take him out of. And these guys were all saying, man, I I have a burden for this young man. One of them, Josh, he said, (laughs) He's in hell. Think about that. There's no more chance for him. He made a choice, and he didn't even understand the choice that he was making. Nobody talked to him about Jesus. Nobody reached out. Nobody showed him unconditional love when he needed it. Nobody showed him acceptance at a time in his life when he was, didn't know who he was, and nobody was Christ to him. That was their theme for the whole meeting, and I was stunned by it. They weren't angry. They were heartbroken. That's the church of Jesus Christ. That's what men died for on the battlefield 
is this concept called America, which is in God we trust, liberty, and e pluribus unum. Those three together. God is the core. That's, that's, that's what they died for. And I'm not sure if young men today would die for America. Because I'm not sure they know what America is. I, I'm not sure they had the conviction that my grandfathers and your grandfathers had when they went to World War II and they fought against Hitler and fought against Nazism and, and fought against that, that whole concept of, of, that they knew was evil. That's the other thing too. The Bible says, it says that you should, by the, by, by the, by the way of use of your faculties, as you mature spiritually, you should be able to distinguish between good and evil. What is that, what's that saying? They're, what he's saying is, is that you should sense evil way before children start dying. You, you should be able to sense that there is something wrong here and that this guy needs help. And he needs, and, and listen, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to get political here. You can pass, gu- the most dangerous city in America is Chicago, Illinois, and it has the most gun laws. Okay? I don't know that we can eliminate this by making guns illegal. I think we've got to look at the heart. What is causing this in our, this youth, these youth, the, the young people in America today are hopeless and they are, and they are, and they are depressed and, they, and they, are, they are convinced. They've been told by the secular progressives who have, got, have claimed to have uncovered real, the real secrets of life from science and science alone that they're, they're descendants from a one-cell amoeba, they're a complete accident, their t- life is totally random, they have no purpose, and they're just going to die. And when they die, they're just going to be dead. And that's what they tell them. And you live like that long enough, and, you, and that's all you hear, is that you're just an accident. You begin to develop psychological symptoms because you were created to worship God. You are created to understand that you are created in his very image. That he made you for a high and a noble purpose on the earth. And that only you can do what God created you to do. And that when you do it, not only are you successful and you feel fulfilled, you make things better. You make society better. You make it better for everybody around you. When you, when you create a hopeless generation, that's what we have now. These kids are hopeless. So I would like to tell you that it's going to get better. It will get better whenever the church starts reaching out and really starts trying to reach these young men and says, I know your daddy left you. I know you've been rejected. I know you've been taught you're nothing but a piece of pond scum. But I see some potential in you. And I think you can accomplish great things. That's what will make it better. 80% of these mass shooters come from broken homes. 80%. 80%. Here's another high correlation I think is staggering. A high number of these, I don't remember the exact number, but a high number of these young men had become enchanted by a movie called Natural Born Killer. They watch it over and over and over again. What are you putting in their mind? What are you putting in their heart? What are you feeding them? And they're already angry and they feel hopeless and they feel, what's the devil doing? Because the devil is the enemy here, amen? And he's the one that we have to we have, Jesus said, you should be smart to the wiles of the devil. We ought to be reaching out. We ought to be making a difference. And I know many of these men that are on these mass walks have committed to, to going into Lubbock and towns like that and, and seeing if they can find some of these young men that need a father, that need some sort of mentoring and become part of their life, begin to sow into it and help them and, st- and stop this craziness. Amen? Quit chasing rabbits. Let's get to the heart of the deal. The heart of the deal is the heart in these young men. So, would they die for this idea called America? No, because they don't know what it is. 
I watch the Ukrainians fight on TV. And by the way, I've never seen a war that had as much television coverage as the Ukrainians. They're pretty smart. They figure out a way to get those reporters right in there. And Have you ever seen such resolve, man? Have you ever seen such, we're not going to let the Russians rule over us. We're a sovereign nation. And we're not, cha- we're not letting anybody come in here. And, and the way they have fought has been absolutely inspiring to the whole world. And, and they have, uh, they have just, they've got something they're committed to that's bigger than them that they're willing to die for. And many of them have. And, I, and that's been the American history. You know, there, been, there was, a, there was a, 116,000 people died in World War I, Americans. 405,000 died in World War II. 36,000 in the Korean War, 58,000 in Vietnam, and 6,700 died in the Afghan and the Iraqi wars. So all of these, all of these soldiers that we celebrate today, what is it exactly that they died for? It's not a society where nobody knows who they are. It's not a society where there is no God. It's not a society where everybody's just a one cell amoeba and a complete accident. That's not what they died for. They died for a place where family where country, where God were important. That's what they died for. And you've got to get these, you know, I talked to, I had a, I've got a friend that had did six tours of duty in, he was a, he was a, chuck, uh, a helicopter pilot for, uh, for a medic. And uh, he flew a medic helicopter. And he has some hair-raising stories. I mean, you know, it's, he's lucky to be alive. But he's, ran into a commander of his, an old general, uh, who had retired, and he saw him somewhere, and he asked him, he said, so what's your biggest worry? And this old general that had given his life to the country and to duty and service and given it to the military said, I I don't think these kids will defend the wall. I don't know where we get the soldiers. Amen. Well, it's just because they don't know what they're fighting for. I think these kids have all the potential in the world to do something great if we'll start to reach out to them and we'll start to tell them about Jesus and not get apologetic about it. I'm thankful that I live in a part of the country where you can go to the school and you can talk about Jesus. I understand they have parameters, but, you know, if you have kids that want to have a meeting in Hereford schools and they want to to have a Bible study in Hereford schools and it's it's student-led, they let them do it. I'm thankful that we live in a place where when the city commission and people meet, they still pray first. I'm just thankful. I'm thankful to live in that because you don't see that. And the godliness creates such a mist. It's such a fog. They have no idea why their things are falling apart. They can't explain them. We need more money or we need more laws or we need more this or we need more that. No, you need a revival. You need a revival. But I'm, I'm encouraged, like I said, because I happen to lead some young men that I believe are making a huge difference because they're committed to bringing Christ to the people that don't get to hear about him, to making a difference in their life. We celebrate today some heroes. We have to have a memorial. We remember the men and women who died for this idea called America, this three-in-one, God we trust, liberty, liberty. Unique, makes us unique, different from any place else. And we remember a God who created two nations. He created Israel and he created America. And he told Israel, he said, you better build a monument because you're going to have a nations, you're going to have generations that come after you that don't understand what happened here. They don't understand that I'm the one that brought you here. Don't understand that I'm the one that brought you through. And when they quit, Seeing me in history, in their history, they'll start to worship idols. And if you study the history of Israel, you know that's what got them driven off the land is they forgot who God was. And they begin to worship their own idols. How many of you think we're in danger of that in America right now? Amen. We're starting to worship things and put them in the place of God in our society. You're going to make a difference. I'm optimistic that we're going to turn that around. I'm optimistic that we're going to turn that around and we're going to see it. We're going to see. Listen, I listen to guys that have lots of influence like Elon Musk. He don't know anything about God. He knows a lot about science. He knows a lot about money. What kind of a difference would it make if he got saved? 
He also knows, he recognizes political things that are not right when he sees them. Introduce him to Jesus. What would happen if we took our schools over again and saturated them in the Holy Spirit? When's the last time we prayed for our schools here? We have, we have school teachers in our congregation. When's the last time before school started we all go over there and anoint the schools and pray over them? I think we need to start doing that, do y'all? I think we got to start claiming this is holy ground. And the devil can't have it. Do we need to tighten up security and all that? Yeah, you bet. We need to do all of that. I'm not against any of that. We also need to take spiritual authority over our institutions in America, and I really do believe that. Roger was in Washington, D.C. here a couple of weeks ago, and they were in meetings and stuff, and a congressman uh, that he was, he could tell that he was, something was weighing heavy on his heart, and, and uh, one of the guys that was in the meeting with him, they were going, he was going into an important meeting, and they were discussing some issue. I don't even know what the issue was. And, and, and the guys that were with Rogers, one of the guys from Friona said, Roger, you're the preacher. Won't you pray for him? What? Roger goes, uh, <coughs> oh, okay, okay, yeah, I forgot. That's what I do. And so he went over and prayed for the guy, and it moved him. Don't criticize him if you won't pray for him. And then they went to the next guy. Now Roger was tuned up. And they went to the next guy. And the guy said, get, Roger said, get over here. I want to pray for you. They all appreciated it. See, this is where the church has been weak is we've been, oh, well, we can't go in there. You better go in there. You better go in there and you better bring the light. I love what it says in Ephesians chapter 5. It says, you don't associate with darkness because you were darkness once, but you are no more. Now you're the light of the Lord. And where you go, the light is shined. And that that darks, that was dark becomes light. How do you change Congress? How do you change the direction of the school systems? How do you change these things? With your presence. You take the light and you go into the dark place. Amen. I don't want... I don't know how many of you have got ancestors. How many of you have people in your family that, that, are, that are veterans that perished in war? <coughs> when I get to heaven, I don't want to apologize to mine and explain to them how we let the thing they, di they died for slip away because we were afraid we were going to get a little dirt on us. We've got to fight for these things. Amen. Amen.